Hey, Heavenward Christian family and any visitors we have with us today, it is so good to be with you. I am always grateful for any opportunity we have to come together in the name of the Lord and open up His Word. So let's begin our time together the way that I begin every time I read the Word. I ask the Lord to help me. I ask the Lord to reveal the truth that He has for me. And let's just ask the Lord to do that for us now, individually and collectively. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you're a great God. You tell us, Lord, if we need wisdom, all we need to do is ask for it, and you'll send it down in full measure without finding fault. Father, we're living in a world where there's a lot of questions. We're living in a world where there's a lot of turmoil. We're living in a world where there's a lot of division. May we understand, Lord, how we are to live in this world, because we represent you, not just ourselves. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you for every word that's in it. And then, Father, we pray, Lord, that today the very things you'd have us glean would be the things we take in. And whatever we take in, may we, through the strength of your spirit, live out. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're new to us this morning, we are taking a momentary segue from our regular practice, our common practice, if you will, of going verse by verse through books of the Bible. We are engaged right now in the middle of a character study on a person by the name of Job. I've entitled this character study, Life Between the Questions. The first question that we saw to ask and answer a few weeks ago was this. What do you do when something's already going bad and then it starts to go worse? Have you ever been in a situation like that where you really felt like you hit the bottom? But then all of a sudden you recognize you didn't hit the bottom because something bad was worse. What do you do in a situation like that? Last week when we were together, we sought to ask and answer this question, what does a hurting friend need most? I'm grateful that Job answered that question because no one went through hurt more than Job. And I'm even more grateful that the answer they gave isn't just the right answer. I'm grateful that the Lord had it placed in his word. And what did Job say that a hurting friend needs most? The answer can be summarized in one word, kindness. Kindness is love in action. Kindness reveals itself in compassion by seeking to offer relief and trying to understand or at least acknowledge the pain that another person is going through. When people hurt, they don't need a lesson in systematic theology or a lecture on how they ought to feel. What do they need? Well, the Bible tells us kindness. What did they need? Well, Job, who went through more than anyone else on the face of the earth, said kindness. In Job chapters 4 and 5, we, we are introduced to a man named Eliaphaz. He heard Job's words, but he was deaf to the heart behind his words. And so when he's sitting with his friend and he's going through such a difficult time, what does he do? He offers him no kindness. Job was struggling. He was really struggling. He was struggling so greatly that he said that he wished he had never been born. He wasn't just facing something that was an annoyance. He wasn't just facing something that was an irritation. He wasn't just in the midst of a difficulty time or going up against a hurt. He was in a crisis, and in this crisis, he desperately needed kindness. Now hold that context in your mind and heart as we look at how Bildad, another one of Job's friends, responded. Turn with me, if you will, to the book of Job, chapter 8, and look with me at verse 2. Bildad is speaking, and he says, How long you say such things, your words are like a blustering wind. In other words, when he's sitting with Job and he hears Job's plight and he hears about all the different things that are going on, what does he say? He says, Job, you're nothing but an old windbag. Now let those words sink in. Let them sink in deep. After pouring out his heart, one of Job's friend, a treasured fam, a man by the name of Eliaphaz, told him he must have been a mighty sinner. And because he was a mighty sinner, that's why he's going through all these different turmoils and all these different trials and temptations. And then another one of his trusted friends, a man by the name of Bildad, comes up to him and says to him, essentially, Job, I'll tell you why you're going through so many things, because you're filled with hot air. Now, why was Bildad so defensive? Well, some insight is given in verse 3. Look at it with me. Does God pervert justice? Does the Almighty pervert what is right? Let's pause for a little while. 
and make sure that we really glean what he's saying and what he's expressing so we can be wise, so we can know how to not only live our lives in the best way, but help other people who are going through pain. Why was this man so defensive? It may be that he just didn't know what to say, but he felt the need to say something. You ever get into a situation like that? You just don't know what to say. You're hoping that no one will ask you to say anything, but you feel like you have to say something, and that may have been what was going on inside of Build That's Heart. It may be that he was totally worn out. Remember what had happened in his life. He too had gone through a difficult time. The Bible tells us that he traveled a long way to be with his friend Job, and then when he saw him, he cried out and he mourned out for all to hear. And then together they sat down in the midst of sadness and were completely silent for seven days. And then after the seven day period of time was over, Job went on to share lament after lament after lament. And if you've ever been with somebody who's going through something like that, their hurt becomes your hurt, especially if you really care about them and especially if you really love them. And it can certainly take a toll on you as well. It may be that Bildad was utterly frustrated and completely confused. It may be something else too. And this is what I really like you to ponder. It may be that he felt the need to defend God. You hear that again? It may be that he's sharing those words that are so very unkind at the worst possible time, because he felt the need to defend God. Now, can we talk? I hope we can. I hope we can talk at a deep and personal level. I fully believe that God is completely fair and absolutely just. I believe that he is omniscient. If you're not familiar with that term, that means all-knowing. I believe that he's omnipresent. That means he has the ability to be everywhere at the exact same time. And I believe that he is omnipotent or, or powerful. I do not buy into open theology, which tells us that God doesn't know everything that will take place. I certainly do not buy into some form of process theology that says that God is limited in his response. What does the Bible teach? Well, it seems rather clear to me that the Bible teaches that God is omniscient, he's omnipresent, and he's omnipotent. I believe that the Lord is merciful, and I believe that the Lord is infinite loving. I hate it when people use the Lord's name in vain. I hate to see people treat treat Jesus Christ like a Santa Claus, a vending machine, or their own personal their own personal genie. The Lord really is my dearest friend. I love, if you know me at all, I love the study of creationism and I love the study of apologetics. I enjoy so much watching debates and presentations by gifted people such as Josh McDowell, Ravi Zacharias, and William Lane Craig. I love to read books, not only books that I agree with, but books that I don't agree with so that I can better be prepared to be able to share a response if someone asks me a question. And I also love to read books in the hopes of learning some new truths. I welcome, genuinely welcome, honest questions, even hard ones. But it is my desire, my utmost desire, to share biblical truth with a Christ-like heart and spirit. That's not easy. That's not easy, but it certainly is more effective. And be assured of this, it is our marching orders as Christians. It's been said, and rightly so, that the sureness of a person's position is best measured by the softness by the softness of the words. I believe that's true with every fiber of my being. So please hear it again. The sureness of a person's position is best measured by the softness by the softness of the words. We saw that truth when we were studying First Peter verse by verse. Keep your finger in the book of Job, but turn with me to First Peter and look back at a very familiar passage of Scripture, chapter three, verses thirteen through sixteen. When writing about the suffering that sometimes we have to endure for the cause of Christ, Peter was led of the Spirit to write these words. He says, "Who's going to harm you if you're eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for it is right, you are blessed." Do not fear what they fear. Do not be frightened, but in your hearts set apart Christ as Lord. Always, not sometimes, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you for the reason, for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience. Why? 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 Well, listen to how the verse continues. So that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. Peter says what? Peter says, always be ready to give an answer to the faith that lies within you. People are only going to ask for an answer if they see that, that faith is evident. And he says, you need to be prepared to share it at all times, even when you're struggling, even when you're going up against intense 
pressure, but he never tells us in this particular passage, nor is there any other passage in the Bible, that when we share about the faith that is within us, that we're to be defensive. He says that we are to share the message about the reason for our faith with gentleness and respect. Volume and truth, they're not synonymous. Haughtiness and harshness certainly are not holy. Being reactive isn't being righteous. Being cutting, much less coarse in our attitudes and our actions, it is not Christ-like. When people are defensive around me, I find myself thinking, are you trying to convince me or are you really trying to convince yourself? When we get upset and we start to yell, threaten, or become somewhat terse, especially when talking about God, I believe that the world looks at us and it says, who are you trying to convince, me or yourself? And while we're talking, let me quickly add that one may win an argument without ever raising his or her voice. But if our words are not peppered with genuine love and care, I doubt that they'll lead too many people to the Lord, but they certainly could push them away. Maybe you've seen that. I know I have. Sometimes people have won the argument, but they push so many people further away, not just from themselves, but from the Lord himself. Some time ago, I told you about a pastor who was a very good debater. He was a, a trained debater. And one day, a person walked into his church and started to get into a discourse with him after the service. And when they started to talk, it became real clear real quickly that the pastor was very apt at being able to defend himself when it came to a debate. And he virtually beat up the man who asked him the questions in the name of the Lord. Many of the parishioners, after the discussion had finished, came up and congratulated the pastor, but an older, wise person, a little old lady, came up and said, Pastor, you may have won the argument, but after what just took place, I can't help but think it's going to be much harder now to win that, Lord, that man to the Lord than ever before. Can I ask you a question? What's more important? Can I ask you a question? What's more valuable? Can I ask you a question? What is more Christ-like? If you truly want to win a person to the Lord, if you truly want to encourage a person to come back to the Lord, share biblical truth in a way that shines the love of Christ to him or her. Share biblical truth in a way that shines the love of Christ to him or her. It is possible to love the sinner and at the very same time hate the sin. And it certainly is far more effective than the other way around. Now, Bildad, this is the second friend of Job who's speaking to him. He didn't seem to grasp that particular truth at this time. Maybe he didn't even desire to grasp this particular truth at this time. So what does he do? He continues to build his case. Look with me what he says in Job chapter 8, verses 11 through 13. He says, Can papyrus grow tall where there is no marsh? Can reeds thrive without water while still growing and uncut? They wither more quickly than grass. Such is the destiny of all who forget God. So perish the hope of the godless. Now remember what's going on with Job. He's not going through an irritation. He's not going through just a, a little bit of a trial or an annoyance of some time. He's not just going through a, a hard time. He's going through a crisis. And his friend comes up to him, his first friend who speaks and says, you're only going through a crisis because you're a, you're a sinner. And when you get right with God, things are going to go better in your life. Then the other friend comes up and says, you're just an old windbag. And when he continues speaking after he says that, he gets so personal and he becomes so insulting. He says that this is what happens. This is the destiny of all who forget God. So perish the hope of the godless. Now, do you see what I do in those words? In essence, he was saying what? He was saying that plants without water wither and die. And since Job seemed to be withering spiritually, he must have forsaken God. Therefore, according to Bildad's assertion, Job must have been a backslider or at least a hypocrite. Bildad doesn't stop there, though. He continues in verses 14 and 15, saying that the faith of a hypocrite is like a spider web. It offers no real support. And then in verses 16 through 19, he says that a hypocrite is like a plant with shallow roots clinging to the rocks, and the plant like that will be pulled up, and then it will wither and die. What's Bildad doing? Bildad is reasoning that nobody pulls up a good plant. So there had to be something wrong with Job or God wouldn't have allowed him to be uprooted. 
And then he concludes his argument, and I want you to see his words. Look at me at verse 20. Surely God does not reject a blameless man or strengthen the hands of evildoers. In other words, Bildad was saying, God doesn't cast away a righteous person. So Job, you've got to have some sin in your life, and the sin you have in your life has to be grave, and it has to be awful. Repent. Get things right with God, and if you get things right with God, you will find that he will make things right for you. Let's talk about these words. As I examine these verses, and I, and I pray and ask God to help me understand them, I see some truth, I see some error, and I see some truth that's been misapplied. Now please listen to my words very closely and very carefully, but far more importantly, hear biblical truth. The law of the harvest is real. The law of the harvest is real. There's no doubt about that truth. And if you lived a little while, you are aware of its reality and you know that it's very plain and it's very simple. The law of the harvest is real. Paul talked about this in Galatians chapter 6, verse 7, when he said, Whatever a person sows, that is what they will reap. Therefore, it's always wiser to be careful about what you sow than what it is to later on pray for some sort of a crop failure. Amen to that. That's so true, so very true. We all only have to look around and see what's going on. All we have to do is read the paper. All we have to do is watch the news, and we see that the law of the harvest is real. We see the reality of that truth time and time and time again. Yet, in Job's case, we know the background. We know that Job's plight had nothing to do with personal sin. In fact, it was because he was such an upright man that he found himself in this particular position. That's right. It's because he was such an upright man that he found himself in this particular position. Now, can you think of some other examples of people who you know or people in the Bible who were living so well they went through some difficult times. The first person that comes to my mind is the blind man. We read about him in John chapter 9, verse 3. The Bible tells us that when the apostles were traveling with Jesus and they saw the blind man, they said to the Lord, they said, Who sinned that this man was born blind? Did he sin or did his parents sin? And Jesus, you remember how he answered? He said, Neither this man nor his parents sin, but this happened so the work of God may be displayed in his life. Wow. Sometimes discipleship is costly, very costly. And what do we know? The blind man wasn't the first and he wasn't the last one who was living such an exemplary life that he went through difficult times to be able to show the power of God. What about John the Baptist? Remember what happened to him? He stood strong and because he stood strong for the Lord, not for himself, for the Lord, what happened to him? He was beheaded. He wasn't beheaded due to personal sin. He was beheaded because he was acting righteously. And what about the apostles? The Bible tells us about a time that Jesus was the apostles and he gathered them up and he put them all on a ship and he said, sail across the lake. And when they sailed across the lake, what did they encounter? They encountered a very horrible storm. They didn't encounter the storm because they sinned. They encountered the storm because they were following exactly what the Lord had for them. And how about the apostles later in their life? You know the story and you know history. History tells us that each and every one of the apostles, other than John, John the Revelator, were martyred. And John was put in oil and they boiled him and they couldn't quite kill him when they put him there. So they exiled on the Patmos where he was for a long time, the Alcatraz of the day. Why? Because he was being unrighteous? No, because he was being righteous. Again, hear my heart very closely and very carefully, but far more importantly, hear biblical truth. Sin will always cause a price to be paid. Don't ever forget that. Sin will always cause a price to be paid. We don't break the commandments, the commandments break us. But there are times when personal sin has nothing to do with our suffering. Yes, there are times when personal sin has nothing to do with suffering. It happened a long time ago, but it's one of those things you never forget. My older sister was trying to adopt a baby, and she had looked for a baby far and wide. And then I reached out to some of my friends, and I found a young woman who was pregnant, and she met my sister, and my sister was going to adopt her baby. And I remember she flew into Albuquerque, and she was so excited. And the next morning when I talked to her, she said, Ronnie, I just have to tell you something. She said, the baby has something wrong with her, and the baby, the doctor's saying, will soon die. And then the baby did die. 
And when the baby died, my sister yelled out, Ronnie, why did this precious baby die? What did she do? What did I do? What did we do? I prayed and prayed and prayed as to how to respond. And I finally responded by saying, I don't believe that you or the baby have caused this tragedy. All I can tell you is that we live in a sinful world. We live in a sin-scarred world. We live in a sin-soaked world. Difficult things are going to happen to people. And being a Christian doesn't exempt them from that truth. This earth is not heaven. We don't understand why babies die. We don't understand why some of the more godly people we know have suffered. These questions are behind what Paul calls the darkened glass that we can only see and understand to the same degree we're able to perceive what's behind darkened glass. That means something very important to us in our practical everyday lives. That means we need to be very, very careful before saying, thus saith the Lord. Because when you say, thus saith the Lord in the wrong way, what are you doing? You are using the Lord's name in vain. Careless words, careless words can push a person not just away from us. Careless, pers careless words can push a person away from God. I'm sure you've seen that. I know that I have. This is what happened to Job. Now he's got a chance to respond. Listen, look with me at his words in Job chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. The Bible tells us then, He's speaking about after Bildad's accusations. Job replied, Indeed, I know that this is true, but how can a mortal man be righteous before God? What's that telling us? It tells us that Job knew that God punishes evil and he, re he rewards righteousness. But in Job's case, this truth was misapplied. In his case, he was being used as an example to discredit the evil one who was the very one who proposed this plan. If Job had known that, it probably would have made some of the suffering there in his life easier to endure. But as far as we know, he never did. Now, I believe that God put this book, this book called Job, in the Bible for a reason. I believe this book, as much as any, help us get a whole lot more in touch with the external and a whole lot less in touch with the temporal. I believe that this book, as much as anything that we read in the Bible, helps us understand there are a whole lot more things going on than what we see and what we understand. Job reminds us that our character is far more important to God than our comfort. He reminds us that God's ultimate objective for us is to take his children to the very special place that he has made for them, a place called heaven. But at this point in Job's life, he didn't seem to grasp that, or maybe he didn't choose to grasp that particular truth. No doubt, it's, hold on, it's hard to hold on to this kind of a truth in the midst of a crisis. At this point in his life, what's he focused on? He's focused on earthly travail rather than eternal promises. And who in this room can't relate to that in one way or another? Because it's so burned within him, what does he decide to do? He decides that he wants to argue his case before the Lord to prove that the things that were happening to them, he did not deserve. However, what do we know when we read this particular passage? Job also knew that God's wisdom was infinitely above any kind of human wisdom, and his power was way too great to be debated. So Job was a man in conflict. He was being pulled by both worlds. And I want you to see his thoughts, because he expresses his thoughts out loud. Look with me at chapter 9, verse 3 and 4. Though one wished to debate with him, he says, God, he could not answer him, God, one time out of a thousand. His, the Lord's wisdom, is profound. His power is vast. Who has resisted him, God, and come out unscathed? Listen to the last few words from the ESV translation. It says it this way, Who has hardened himself against him? Who has hardened himself against God? and succeeded? Let me answer that question. No one. No one. You can't outwit God. You can't outthink God. And you can't overpower God. Job is getting a very important lesson, a lesson in humility. And in verses 5 through 31, we get some insight as time and again, Job points out how much greater God is than him. Finally, the lesson Job gets is over. Look with me what he has said about what he learned and declared in verse chapter 9, verses 32 through 35. He, or God, is not a man like me that I might answer him, that we might confront each other in court. 
If only there were someone to arbitrate, the King James Bible says, to, to mediate between us, to lay his hand upon both of us, someone to remove God's rod from me so that his terror would frighten me no more. Then I would speak up without fear of him, but as it stands now with me, I cannot. Even in the midst of adversity, what was Job wise enough to know and declare? That on his own, he could not even approach God. What a pity and what a tragedy it is that some people say that after they pass on and come face to face with God, they're going to challenge him or they're going to pepper him with question after question. When I hear people say that, I think to myself, really? Like Job, you're going to find when you come before God that you're going to recognize you need an advocate. And without the advocate, the only thing that would happen to you if you came before God is that you would be in fear and all to the point of utter speechlessness. Job, he yearned for an advocate, a mediator between God and himself. Once again, remember that Job did not know what we know. The advocate has come. Thank the Lord, the advocate has come. Listen how Paul describes what took place to young Pastor Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, saying, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Wow. Jesus is our mediator. And because he is, we are able to experience tremendous blessings. I want you to see what the writer of Hebrews has to say about the blessings we're able to experience because Christ is our mediator. In chapter 4, verse 14 through 16 of Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews says, Therefore, since we have such a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast or firm to the faith we possess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who is tempted in every way, just like us yet was without sin. Let us approach the throne of grace with confidence. In King James it says boldly, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. This truth, this truth, that we have a mediator who understands everything we've gone through, that we have a mediator who can help us overcome whatever may come our way, was made clear when Jesus was on the cross. I love how Mark described it in chapter 15, verse 38, telling us that when Jesus died, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. That ripped curtain tells us that we have the opportunity to now come before God with confidence, but it also reminds us of two essential truths we do well to hold real closely, to hold real dearly. And the first one is found in James chapter 1, verse 17, where we read, Every good and perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change with the shifting shadows. These words remind us that it wasn't God who sent the thieves to steal Job's camels and oxen and donkeys. It wasn't God who sent the fire to consume his sheep. It wasn't God who sent the great wind that killed his children. It wasn't God who struck Job with boils. Who was it? It was Satan. It was the evil one. When suffering and adversity comes, remember everything good comes from God. The evil one is the cause of suffering. The evil one is the cause of adversity. When he tempted Adam and Eve to sin and they yielded, all kinds of evil were unleashed. Sin, sin, sin put thorns on roses, fierceness in animals and discouragement and disease and death into our lives. That's why bad things happen. The Bible tells us the effects of sin will continue to be unleashed in this world in an ever-increasing measure until the end of the age. But please hear my heart very closely and very carefully. And again, far more importantly, hear biblical truth. That will not be the case forever. Amen. Aren't you glad? That will not be the case forever. Why? Because we have a mediator. We have a savior. As Christians, who do we have? We have Jesus Christ. And because that's true, listen to what God has promised will take place one day. Turn with me in your Bibles and look at it. Let's look at it together. Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 5. Then I, this is John who's speaking, 
saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven of the atmosphere and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea, no longer any separation. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He, God, will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. Why? Look how the verse continues. For the old order of things has passed away. He who is seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Let's try to put everything together. Yes, bad things do happen. And why do they happen? Because the evil one is real and because sin exists. Sometimes we suffer because we yield to his temptations. Sometimes the blame is fully on us, and that's why we're suffering. That's the law of the harvest. What a person sows, that shall they reap. Sometimes we suffer simply because we live in a sin-scarred world, and sometimes we are called to suffer to demonstrate the reality and the power of Jesus Christ. Yes, there are times that we don't understand. There are times when we find ourselves in our hearts, in our prayers, we're shouting out loud, why, why, why? Some of those whys will be answered on earth and some of those whys won't be answered until we get to heaven. But hear me very closely and hear me very carefully. The story, your story, will not be over then. In fact, the scripture tells us that in many ways, at that particular time, it will just be beginning. I'll tell you why. Because a new world is coming. A new world is coming. The old order of things will one day pass away, and God has promised he will make all things new. Why do bad things happen? We don't know all the answers. But we need to be very, very careful before we respond. But this much we do know. God is faithful. Everything good comes from God. And God can be trusted. He has promised us that someday justice will prevail and someday sin will be fully conquered. Oh, what a difference that makes. Oh, what a difference that makes when we go through bad things, difficult things, when bad things happen. Let's go, Lord, in prayer. Father, we pray, Lord, that we would make the choice, Lord, to see through the lens of Scripture, not just the world, but our personal worlds. May we yield to you, Lord, in those times we don't understand. May we trust you when we're, when we're shaken, when we're worried, when we're up and we're down like an escalator and we don't even know where we are. May we recognize, Lord, that you are the giver of life and life more abundant. May we have a an eternal view, viewpoint in this world instead of just a temporal one. May we recognize, Lord, that whatever we face, you are stronger than whatever it may be. And Lord, may we know that one day we'll be finished with the troubles and trials of this life and we'll live with you the life you've wanted us to live from the very beginning. Father, may we remember where we're going and may the reality of that particular truth affect the way we live now. Father, we never know all the answers. But we do know the answer, Jesus Christ, and that changes everything. So, Father, we don't know all the whys and the whats, but we do know the who. And may he be our focus, even when times are hard. For we pray in Jesus' name.